Welcome to the Top Order Podcast. All four of us back in a room for the first time in a little while. A welcome back to Rajiv Reddy on the pod. We're going to talk a bit of New Zealand, Australia. So Australia win again. Uh, Lippy have written a demoralising loss for NZ. We'll come on to that. We'll talk about the same as Matt Henry, Cameron Green. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of offspin as well. Glenn Phillips and Nathan Lyon. Changes for the second test match. We're also going to cover in the second half of the podcast, India versus England. We haven't had a deep dive into the fourth test which was a missed opportunity for England or credit to India we'll cover all that in the second half alongside Drew Jarrell Joe Root's return to form the spinners again a bit of Shubman Gill and then changes and a preview for the fifth and final test of this series in Dharamsala where it's going to be one degree and sleeting mm-hmm. and may also be Johnny Bairstow's 100th test all coming up on the Top Water Podcast stay tuned well, boys, as we said in the intro, great to be back in a room together. First time all four of us have been here for a wee while. We're going to be talking, I guess, from a New Zealand perspective about um, a loss on home soil at the Basin Reserve. Lippy, you're pretty demoralised, I think, by, by this. I'm going, to, I'm going to come to you first um, uh, to get your, yeah, your views on the, on the test match that wrapped up, what, a couple of days ago? Well, you've used demoralised a few too many times already for, for my liking. Well, you've, but, you've written the run notes. You can yeah. tell because there's off spinners all, all up. Yeah, the rest, the rest of the show is just <laughs> filled with off spinners. It's mostly finger spin from actually, here Actually, when on I out. look at that, there's 11 bullet points and there's seven of them are off spinners, <laughs> yeah, including Ben Folks. Yeah. But you, bowl some useful tweakers. You've got, yeah. you got a keeper in there, though, though so that's good. He bowls off spin. Yeah, yeah all keepers enough. bowl off spin. Yeah, they do. <laughs> But I mean, look, you know, me and Raj talked about this uh, kind of at the day of the the game, the the end of the game, and yeah, like me and Baldy have talked about it before. The the fact that New Zealand plays against Australia so rarely in Test cricket, these tests have come to mean more and more to us as fans, and it just seems like every single time we play Australia, we kind of get our hopes up. We think, okay, like this Australia side has got some weaknesses. And then for some reason or another, New Zealand just doesn't put their best foot forward. And um, I mean, I spent the, yeah, I spent pretty much since then kind of in a woe is me kind of, you know, feeling like, you know, why is this happening? Like, why is this happening to me? Which is really a rational way to think about things. But when you, you know, when you're a fan and you just want them to kind of turn up and, and I suppose in this test, they showed that on day one and day three, they could compete with Australia. They, they, you know, exposed some of Australia's weaknesses. And then in the bad moments, it's just so, so bad. Yeah, I think pain is what sums up the, uh, the feeling for me. Uh, it's been raining, which kind of matches my, <laughs> my mood as well. And I'm happy there's been 48 hours since the, uh, the result happened to sort of calm me down. I was a bit fired up, I think, a bit around uh, when we did when we did lose in the end. Um, I don't know what you guys covered in the preview. Obviously, I wasn't I wasn't here for that. But for me, the loss doesn't matter as much. You know, the New Zealand mm-hmm. losing to Australia. You know, you win some, you lose some. That sport, but the manner of how we lost or how we played at certain parts of of that game. You know, the the first session when we won the toss with a new ball on a very uh, a pitch that looked very conducive to bowling. Uh, you know, we didn't really make an Indian in that first session. The opening session on day two was no, it, where we well, the... where we struggled to take a wicket, and then the the session that followed that, uh, where we just lost wickets and we really gave wickets away at points um, throughout the the rest of that day too. It just it just really brings me down because because it's not a skill thing like no. you mentioned. It's not a skill thing. It is a a mental block that we've currently got. Uh, and Lip, do you agree with those those sentiments? I think we have to now. Like that that's sort of like it's so weird because you think like these guys half of these guys haven't even played Australia in a test match before, you know, the Ravindras, the the like yeah, and Willow Rourke, Kugeline, uh, you know, uh, Phillips, like so many of them just haven't played Australia in a test match because we don't play them. But for some reason it kind of just seems to be there because as you say, like New Zealand comp- like I think uh you, you pinpointed the first session. I think Matt Henry in particular was a bit unlucky actually. Mm. I thought he bowled mm. I mean we'll get to him, but like I, I genuinely think this was his best performance in a test for New Zealand. Like the way he opened the bowling, the way he bowled throughout the test match was was absolutely brilliant. But then, you know, you just go on through that day and we start picking wickets. We get to a situation where we're, you know, 270, whatever it was for, for nine. And you think, OK, New Zealand's like New Zealand's in this test. Like maybe Australia's fought back well and, that, you know, Cameron Green, great innings. 
And then you get to that first session on day one and, and just seemed like the plans weren't there. It, like all of the basic things that you think of, okay, we'll, we'll go out and execute these things. It just didn't happen. And, and I, I just can't, for the life of me, think why that would happen. It's interesting. It's the same lamentation that I had when Australia were bowling against the number t- 9, 10 and 11 for Pakistan and the West Indies this summer. The inability to hit the stumps and to bowl the ball at the top of off stump against 9, 10 and 11. I think, you know, you have a look at the way Australia, uh, New Zealand bowled to Cameron Green in particular. They were prepared to give him one. Mm. Whereas actually what we learned throughout the course of the test match is that first, first thing in the morning is actually the hardest time to bat and or the new ball. And they had a brand new ball on the beginning of day two. It was only four or five overs old. Yeah. There was an opportunity, and Matt Henry went past Cameron Green's bat a number of times on, on day two, even though he was like coming down the wicket and advancing. There was an opportunity there to take his wicket with good bowling rather than concede one immediately or, or concede that kind of, you know, we're not going to try and get Cameron Green out. We're going to try and bowl at Nathan Lyon only. And, and New Zealand just didn't hit the stumps enough, didn't bowl enough balls on the stumps. I think it was three out of the first... 75 were, were going to hit the stumps, including a, a, an early Yorker. Well, yeah, look, I guess Bordy's doing a bit of your whinging for you about that <laughs> inability to, to hit the, the top of the stumps. And look, yeah, I agree. I think we've seen it quite often, though, in test matches in recent mm-hmm. times. The uh, number 9, 10 Jack come out to bat, and all of a sudden teams go, well, instead of nicking guys off or bowling that sort of top of, top of off or fourth stump, we're going to go for bumpers or we're going to go for, you know, more one day tactics, and, and, and it hasn't worked. But look, uh, you've written demoralised in the, the intro. I'm feeling bloody demoralised now. We're going to fly down to Christchurch for the <laughs> test match on Friday. I was really looking forward to it. Now I'm kind of you know, going to unpack my carry-on, I think, like if, if it's going to be as doom and gloom as uh, as the opening 10 minutes of the pod. Let's give Baldy some bragging rights. What, what were you impressed with from an Australian perspective? Because you, you mentioned in brief there Cameron Green, but you, let's... Go upbeat for at least yeah. thirty seconds, please. Yeah, let's let's fill the cup at least halfway full with with Cameron Green talk. You and I spoke in the preview show, mm. Stu. What would I wish for in this series from Australia was that Cameron Green would stand up under pressure and show us that he's got some substance in his game, and we've seen that absolutely um, from him in the first and also the second innings. I think it wasn't easy conditions to bat yeah. there, and you know wickets were falling around him uh, in that second innings as well. So an outstanding performance from Cameron Green. He started to convert all of the potential that he's got into performance on the field. And for him to go from 100 not out overnight to 174, that's incredibly pleasing. But the most pleasing part for me is his ability to bat when the conditions were really tough. Guys getting starts around him and then getting out, very disappointing from that point of view. But he was able to stand tall and and really show us that he's not just a flash in the pan, that he actually has some substance and some you know, mental mental strength in the top two inches. And let's also maybe try and get Stu up a little bit. And I, I know it's going to be difficult to do, but can we talk a little bit of, of off spin? Um, so let, let's Bef- give... Before we do that, can I just make a point on, on Green? The, the bit that I was most impressed of, as much as I hated it while he was batting with Hazelwood, I think that the way he managed that innings was just mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic. And if you're thinking, okay, well, here's a young guy like trying to make his way at number four... Mm. Yes, New Zealand bowled poorly in the way that, you know, you've just outlined they bowled too short to him and to Hazelwood. They were waiting for him to make a mistake. And if you look back through pretty much the whole way that he batted, as you said, first innings and second innings, really difficult pitch. And he, after, you know, after his initial tough spell going past the edge and things, he was the only one pretty much in that whole test that looked at ease. Yeah, he and Phillips looked at ease. The, yeah, I, I think you're right. The thing that was really impressive in the second day was that where he took his risks, mm. like he had to take risks to score boundaries because New Zealand put the field back and he decided that he was going to choose a couple of spots. Deep square leg was one, deep mid wicket when there wasn't a fielder there was another. And he just worked the ball around, he hit the ball into gaps and then ball four, five, six in the over, he was able to get ones on a regular basis at really, really well played yeah. innings. There, there was a bit of Stokes or, uh, yeah, flint, flint off of that, that kind of, uh, that yeah. kind of approach. Absolutely. Um, Let, let's talk a bit of off spin. We've got to go to Bordy first for the Nathan Lyon appreciation. And, and then I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit of Glenn Phillips. That was, yeah, look, that was a really good little session, um, to watch from a New Zealand perspective. So we'll come on to some of those positives, but Nathan Lyon, Bordy, the, yeah, the, the, the goat gets even goatier. He does. <laughs> I told you, he's such a good bowler. Right? I've been saying it for years. Um, no, no, you, you've got to give him credit when he when he does this 
um, kind of performance for Australia, right? When there's when there's spin on offer, and there was spin and yeah, bounce, even from day so one. Much. Um, it's fantastic for for Nathan Lyon to be able to get bounce. He's a, he's a wonderful bounce bowler. It means he can attack from both off the over the wicket and around the wicket. He challenged both edges of the bat. Um, Australia put good fields in place, I think, for Nathan Lyon. The guy around the corner, uh, Steve Smith, took a couple of catches mm. there, yeah. uh, and the, and the short bat pad on the leg side as well. Um, yeah, look, you can't say enough good things about him at the moment. Champion bowler, bowls his team to victory in, in friendly conditions. You can't ask more than that. Oh, I thought he was incredible, actually, Nathan Lyon. And you mentioned that bounce, which is actually something that's really foreign to New Zealand conditions, mm-hmm. that bounce from, from the spin bowlers. I don't know if we're going to talk about the pitch that was prepared mm. being probably not necessarily in our wheelhouse, but um, that, that's another point. Lyon was really good throughout the whole test, I thought. I thought... Moving on to, to Glenn Phillips, you probably want to say something about Lyon, but Phillips, I think, was really one of our best bowlers as well, especially with that, mm. that um, in that inning, second innings where he bowled. And I think the re- the fact he didn't bowl in the first innings, especially during that partnership that mm. we talked about, that final wicket partnership, mm. is a tactical misstep that we'll look back well, on and go to. Especially with the left under yeah. as well. Mm, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think the bounce caught New Zealand on the hop, actually. And I don't I, think... And Alex Carey as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah it caught Carey a couple of times, actually. Yeah, And... I don't think New Zealand planned... Well, they clearly didn't because Gary said it has admitted after the match that they didn't plan for that much bounce and turn. No. And, and, and I think New Zealand probably would have picked a different side. Had, oh, they've already said as yeah, much. Yeah, they, they would have picked centre so, if they'd known yeah. that it was going to... But, but I'm, I'm almost glad they didn't in that you've actually learned something about Glenn, Glenn Phillips' bowling in this test if you didn't already know it. Yeah. Be- before we come on to selections, Glenn Phillips, from, from your perspective, Lipper, you must have been pleased to watch... Oh no, yeah, the, the whole the whole offspin show was you know like I've talked about Lyon before. I I, I think uh, you know he gets as the the goat part gets a bit you know mocked, but actually like the fact for someone to take five hundred test wickets when you're a conventional offspinner, I think that in itself is actually remarkable. And when you watch him bowl, like this is gonna this is gonna you know nerd me out here but like the 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 loop that he gets the kind of curve of the ball you know the up the down and then the off the, the off spin I, I think you know I, I've never seen anyone do it better really in the way that he goes about his business and it made it really really hard you saw the way that Blundell went out both of his times he they were trying to get to the pitch of it he just couldn't get there because of the way that Lyon was able to dip the ball and it meant that he was in all sorts of trouble so yeah fantastic that that Lyon was able to do that before I get to well, it's a question for you, really. I mean, we haven't talked about the terrible New Zealand batting, but the, someone said to me today that uh, they, I mean, they weren't really putting Lyon down, but they were sort of saying, do you think that Nathan Lyon gets a lot of his wickets because of the fact that uh, that Australian attack in itself is just so good that the fact that you know there's just no outs like nobody you know hey Stark yes Baldy messages us on after the first over and says you're going to smash Stark today because he's bowled one off one wide but you know the 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 way that Hazelwood Cummins they they just tie you down and they don't let you get off strike so you know you go to Lyon and you think okay well now here's my opportunity to score. You know what? Like, how do we kind of combat that as New Zealand batters? And and I guess is that an excuse? Like, where where do we sit in all of that? In the way that New Zealand's been bowled out for under two hundred twice. I think it's one of it's it's a question that's always asked throughout history when we look at the numbers that um, bowlers have when they're bowling in a unit like that. I think that it's actually a hindrance to him having su- that such a good attack attack around him with Hazelwood, Stark, and. Um, Cummins, you know, they're there to take wickets as well. Mm. Uh, in the, on this occasion, in this test match, I think that New Zealand went out and decided that they were going to target him, especially yep. in that first innings, led to those wickets, uh, especially the Blundell one, when Blundell and Phillips actually looked set and they were going to try and resurrect our innings. Uh, the, the little bat pad he had when he was coming yeah. down the wicket was... was um, a symptom or, a, you know, the the result of him trying to attack Lyon. Um, so in this test, I think it helped him, definitely, having mm. that bowling attack around him because mm. they didn't want to face Stark, Cummins and, and Hazelwood for extended periods of time. Uh, but in the longevity of time, maybe it's a different discussion. Well, and even if you just look at their, their economy rates, right, that attack, um, obviously Stark is a little bit more of a... A wicket-taking option, his strike rate would suggest that, but his economy rate would as well. Whereas, you know, Lyon, it's not like he goes regularly for 
you know, even three and a half, four and over, he mm. goes for under three, under three and over, which is comparable to to Cummins. It's comparable to um, to Hazelwood. And I, I, look, I think it's just the balance of that attack, isn't it? Um, you, we, you know, we talk about how good Shane Warren was, and we, we obviously talk about how good that partnership with McGrath was. But I think when you kind of look at this, it's relatively similar. It allows yeah. them really to play a four a four man attack, and you, you've now got the luxury of. Um, Cameron Green able to bowl a, a few, yeah, a few overs. So I think they're going to feel his retirement um, oh, big time, massive, massively. Although Todd Murphy has looked um, a similar type of bowler, but mm. really limited sample size, and it's you know going to take him a little while. You would have mm. thought to, to fill those, you know, fill those boots when when they are hung up. Oh, yeah. by, by Lyon totally I mean like, yeah I mean Lyon now I think they pulled out a stat that he's got Fifers in nine different test playing nations now and I, I think that that yeah. shows how you know his quality in a big big way here's one for you he's closing in on 400 wickets outside Asia as a, as, as a yeah. spin bowler like that's that's pretty hefty yeah. kind of stat stuff book a stag dude to Dublin with a test match it, right. it, is, it is really special and I mean like you wanted to talk about Phillips and the yeah. way that, that he and like we just talked about the difficult craft of offspin. Glenn Phillips in three years has learned to be a, a test quality bowler. And I mean, he genuinely is now. He's like a, huge contributions in Bangladesh, yeah. you know, with bat and ball. And now he's gone and done this. And I, I, look, I mean, this is going to kind of sound silly, but I, I, could, could we play him and Ravindra, I guess, together as our fourth bowler? Is that is that getting like too, too excited at this point? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't see a reason why not. The question that I have is actually around, do we regret not playing an Ajaz, for example, in this test? But definitely, Phillips, I remember going to one of the 2020s in Auckland, I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Pakistan or something a few years ago. And uh, see, at Eden Park. At Eden Park, yeah. and seeing, maybe three or four years ago, and seeing him rolling his arm over mm. before the game, and I'm just looking around at you guys going, what is going on here? Uh, but fair play to him, he's obviously yeah, yeah. worked hard at it, and mm. he is getting the returns. You've alluded it to, to it there, Raj. Selections, a, a beef for you leading into this game? I, I know hindsight's a beautiful thing, but... Have New Zealand got it got it wrong? Whether it's reading the pitch or the squad, even the squad that they picked, obviously leading into the game as well. What, what are your thoughts? My 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 big problem is around Neil Wagner. Um, obviously, that's not, <laughs> that's not a that's not a, a surprise to anybody. I think that who had that in the middle of their bingo square? <laughs> I think that especially this pitch probably would have actually suited him a little bit. And just with the at the moment, the way we've got Henry, we've got Southey. Uh, I feel like they're kind of doing a similar role. You know, Henry's dropped off a few Ks, or maybe he was bowling a little bit slower to, to use the pitch. But they were bowl, they were very similar in terms of what they were bringing to the to the attack. Maybe having a left arm option uh, would have would have helped us, especially with that 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 new ball. But uh, yeah, look at the moment. I I'm I'm not so. so go ahead. No no no. I was going to say at the moment I don't actually know what team they're going to select test to test at the moment. Do New Zealand have any other left arm options other than Sears? No, Sears is Sears is right, right hand. Lister. It's Lister. 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 But, but Lister hasn't really delivered in four day cricket. He's been more of a one day specialist. Yeah, yeah. I don't uh, yeah, I, we don't really is the is the answer to that. There's a few there are a few out there, Ray Tools out there and for C D, but I don't think there's anyone sh- sort of Trent fella called Trent Bolt. Well there's yeah. Trent Bolt, but he's been at the Ambani yeah. wedding, so I don't uh, meeting Mark Zuckerberg, so I don't think he's uh, too sad about well, missing out. He had from, a lot of from, outfit changes as well. We'll, what we'll come I've on seen. to that in the second half of the pod. Is it is it just hindsight or is it obvious to everyone that Mitchell Santner is a better bowler than Scott Kugeline and therefore should have been playing test cricket like is it is it really as simple as that in hindsight probably I mean it, well it is in hindsight especially when you see the pitch I think when they think when they turned up and they saw the green pitch and they went the pitch has been undercover for two days we've probably got to pick our four seamers that's been the formula in New Zealand I can understand why they made that decision I don't like I've said it all along I don't really understand why Kugeline was in this like Kugelin is not the seamer that I would have had in the squad to start with, so that's you know that's a different question. Whether they go on and pick him again in Hagley's, like again, I, I don't know because when you look at the side, obviously I would rather have Santner in that side. He feels he feels like someone who offers more with bat with ball. He's I don't know he's better in the field. Kugelin made a, a pretty horrible drop catch at one point, but the fact that like Hagley is a pitch where we've always played four seamers. So, you know, we're going in with Ben Sears, who I expect to play. You know, great. I'm actually really excited. It sucks for Willow Rourke, who's gone, you know, shown a lot of promise, I think, in these first couple of tests. 
But, you know, to go in and see Ben Sears, I think it's pretty exciting the fact that he can get up to 145, you know, 150 clicks. And the way he kind of took on the Aussies in those T20s mm. was very, very exciting. And it looked like they had a lot of trouble. I mean, you and I, talk, Baldy, we talked about when it got up to those, you know, higher echelons of pace, the Aussies do look like they struggle. And Willow Rourke exploited that a little bit. But, you know, we just didn't do it for long enough in this test. Can I ask you a question without notice? Does it excite you? Does it worry you? that we don't know who we, we, we don't we really don't know who they're going to pick for the second test what that's going to look like uh, no it doesn't really I mean it doesn't concern me I think like I said the the bizarre thing is that uh, you know I mean look I'm I'm slamming the Kugel line selection you know I've just said I wouldn't have picked him in the squad you go. You do look at the his, stats, his though. His first class stats this year are really good, aren't they? He's got. Well, he's leading the plunket. Yeah. Well, he was From, until that. Yeah, yeah. November. But, right. but it's November. But you know, he went away with the Australia, or the New Zealand A squad to Australia A. Scored a hundred. He took a five foot. Like he's actually on paper done the things yeah. that you would want from four day cricket. Yes. I just think that when you're you're building your your side. In that team, they already had Will O'Rourke, who was essentially going to do the same role as what Kugelein was going to do. And, you know, in this test, they've picked Ben Sears because they think he's more equipped. Well, maybe they don't think he's more equipped. Look, Ben Sears could be the 12th man in this game. We, we will find out. But, you know, they've picked Sears, who, as a they think, is the best direct replacement for someone like O'Rourke, who can run in, bowl short, and do kind of the that sort of role for New Zealand. So if you've got one of those bowlers... That's why we didn't play Neil Wagner because they think, okay, Will O'Rourke's quicker, younger, better equipped now to do that role than Neil Wagner has been able to do. So why do we need an, a similar bowler? Maybe we needed someone like a Jacob Duffy who can move it around or, you know, Nathan Smith who's been carving up the Plunkett Shield at, at various times as well. So, you know, there are, there are, you know we could sit here and debate the, the selection all day, but I, I don't think it's wildly negative that we don't know from their squad who they might pick. I'll ask you a question. I'm going to cross codes a little bit. I'm going to ask Baldy this question. Mm. In other sports like NRL, Super Rugby, basketball, football, the teams that tend to win are the teams that play the least amount of players in a season, right? There's less change. Mm -hmm. This New Zealand side has played a lot of different players in the last you know, 12, 18 months, definitely mm. from a bowling perspective as mm. well. Uh, do you think that's an issue? I think it's a point of difference if you look at the stability of the Australian side as regards selection over the last two or three years. You have a look at the guys who've come in and out of the Australian side. Green's come in for Warner. You've had Marsh and Warner are the only real changes in that batting lineup of late. Uh, Cameron Green coming back in, of course. The bowling unit has been reasonably stable, even with an opportunity during the Australian summer to rotate a Scott Boland or a Michael Neeser or a Jai Richardson when he's healthy into the side. They've elected not to do that. So Australia have enjoyed a rare touchwood period of stability as far as health and selection are concerned. Some of the stuff is is for New Zealand dictated by health. You know, Conway's out health. Mitchell has been out health. Jameson. Jameson, that out. Jameson injury, I think, was, is huge. You Again, know? huge. And he's an issue for New Zealand's attack because he is the point of difference. Big, tall guy, can bowl, you know, uh, latest back injury notwithstanding. Well, really, he was really, meant to take over. He really, was really meant to wheels. take the, yep. you know, take the well, reins well, from well, Southie and, and Bolt and these guys. Well, well, and, and Bolt as well, who is still, well, you know, he, he's clearly in your best four test match bowling options probably if he, if he was available but, but he has but it is fair to point out that he when he has come back for New Zealand in recent times he hasn't bowled especially well and he doesn't like he, he's not bowling loads of overs he's bowling four yeah. over spells yeah. I mean it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when you when you stop yes. playing you don't bowl and then when you do bowl you yeah, bowl yeah. a little tiny bit no, oh, look I, I still would like to see him in the side but you know we're yeah. not going to and I think we kind of have to move on yeah. and decide that you know we're not gonna we're not but, gonna see but, him anymore but I think it probably explains why you've ha you've been searching the depth charts of try and find what that combination is going to be you know we talked I think on the preview about whether you know and certainly over the last year or so we've talked about whether Tim Savey you know pace being down and whether he's you know going to be an all format pick and even an all conditions pick for New Zealand as a seamer this, this and, and then we're talking about Jamison and then we're talking about Wagner retiring and then we're talking about Bolt's gone and then we're talking about the depth charts that we're now on to to try and pick your, your seam attack and you know you guys can't agree with your, your third and fourth best seamer are. Um, so yeah I, I think it's it's tough and there's very few teams that are going to be able to do what Raj is talking about which is 
to pick the same players day in and day out. Australia have, you know, had a massive amount of longevity. And how those guys do it. Hazelwood, yeah. Stark, Cummins, they play every game. Play it's every actually format. amazing. Yeah, it, it is, really it is. is incredible. Um, yeah. to, to finish answering Raj, Raj's question, I think you've found the right combination, though, now with the betting. You know, mm-hmm. Devin Conway in for Will Young, and Will Young's kind of your floater, as, as a couple of Australians have been over the last little while. It's the questions around the bowling that will continue to go on because Jamison's going to be out for another year. I think if he was healthy, Jamison, Henry, Santner, and one other, Saudi, is a is a probably a locked in best four bowling attack for all conditions. And I think what New Zealand is starting to learn now is that actually a guy like Mitchell Santner, who is consistently good, even though he might not be sometimes spectacular, is a good foil for the rest of their attack. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully New Zealand can start picking and sticking with some of these guys. Baldy, Baldy, before we move on, I know Binksy wants to get to the England-India stuff. Mm-hmm. We we probably haven't given Australia enough, you know, like enough credit for, for the way they've gone about things. You might want to add a little bit, uh, you know, other players that, that uh, you know, have performed well in this test. But I also think it's, it is kind of worth talking about some of those guys like Manus and, and like I know the test is a long way. Their, their next test, like they're not going to make changes in this game. I'm, I'm pretty confident about that. Mm-hmm. And they keep you know talking about Manus and and uh, you know his that that he'll get he'll come right and all that kind of stuff. The next test isn't till November or December. But people like him and Kerry, there's there's some trouble there, right? Yeah, I, w- I wanted to ask about Kerry as well. So yeah, thoughts thoughts on that. <laughs> I, and I guess it's really just a bat- batting questions for Australia, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's all it's all batting questions. And if you have a look up and down this lineup, it's the same story. Other than Cameron Green's 174 and Nathan Lyons 41 in the second innings, it's a case of either guys got starts and then didn't go on. So if you have a look at the first innings, uh, there were I think three or four starts in that Australian top order. Yeah, 33, 31, 40. You know, three guys got to into the 30s and didn't go on and make a big score. And that's really the difference that we're seeing at the moment is guys are getting starts and then not going on and turning those and converting those into into big scores. Manus is a problem because he actually can't even get a start at the moment. Yeah. His last six or seven bats, he, he can't get a start. He did have some 60s and stuff in, in the early part of the Australian summer, but actually it is it is a concern. It's not enough of a concern that we want to start talking about changing the personnel, but his average now has dropped below 50, I think, in Test cricket. It was 60 12 months ago. What did and we it's... think the actual, the the real Manus average was? 44? 44-45. That's what, 32 over this third of his career or something yeah. like that. So, so he's coming back to the field in a big way. I mean, he's no longer the number one batter yeah. in the world. And, I think, and you know, Smith's all those not things. averaging 80 as an opener anymore. <laughs> well, the, the concern for Smith, if you have a look at the context, that little microcosm of the second innings where, yes, the ball was swinging away from the bat, but he didn't need to play that shot. Yeah. Late in the day, first over, you can let that ball go as an opening bat. And look, I'm not the world's best opening bat. I've never <laughs> played for Australia. But there's still time, ball. There, there is still time. Still moving. Th- there's still over 40s and over 50s and over 60s. So <laughs> I've got plenty of time to get there. But that he doesn't need to play that shot. And it's and it's obvious that he doesn't need to play that shot, yeah. but he's compelled, he's obsessed, he's he's compelled obsessively almost <laughs> to to hit the ball <laughs> with the bat uh, rather than leave it go. I will say though, I thought his opening session on day one, I thought yeah. he was very yeah, that was good. To be fair, you got yeah, you got to take but he the threw it away at the air by yeah, he did. shot, and he knew he'd done it as soon as he played that shot. He he he's off just he's walking, caught. Yeah. He's walking off for it was caught, but he was very good in that first. Uh, first he was, session. yeah. The Australian batters were great day day one session one. They were very very good because we could have easily been thirteen for three. Yeah. Changes for for this test match. We, we've talked that we probably can't predict New Zealand side. Where would you guys want to see? The selections go though for, for New Zealand. Then Baldy, um, yeah, might be a bit quicker with you. Any changes for Australia? <laughs> no. Okay. I don't. I don't know. I actually think that the the team that they picked for the first test will probably suit the the Christchurch pitch a bit a bit more. Um, maybe you could have another paceman in there. I don't know the fourth seamer, but yeah. Well, I mean, Sears will come in for. Well, Sears was into the squad for O'Rourke. I I I think he will play. I think Sears, you know, they're picking him to play because he needs to play that role and I don't think there's anyone else in the squad who will play that. So, I mean, I think it comes down to Kugelin and Santner. I'm sure they'll look at the pitch and decide. 
I would still pick Santner just because of the way, you know, things are. But, you know, again, if you pick Santner, does that mean you don't bowl Phillips and you don't bowl Ravindra very you've much? Got, so you've got three spinners then. Yeah, mm. so, so I don't know. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I, I still would pick Santner because I actually think he, you know, he offers more with the bat as well. He's, a, he's just sort of been in that group and I feel like his... I don't know. He's not. Af- he's not afraid of Australia. We've just talked about you know this mental side of things. He's ha- he obviously has lost to Australia before. He's got those scars like everyone else does. But I just think he's he's up for the fight. You know. Am I am I am I alone when I go? I don't class Glenn Phillips and Ruchan Ravindra as all rounders at this stage. I I class them as batsmen who can bowl. Well, I think that's how they're viewed in the side, and that's mm. the roles they're playing. Um, I guess that was my question before. Like, I wonder what I wonder how far down the line, hopefully in their development, where we can actually play them as legitimate mm-hmm. options, and it means that you can play Will Young and Devon Conway, and you can have a ridiculously strong, on paper at least, batting lineup. I say ridiculously strong; they get bowled out for under two hundred. But you know, like on paper, you can strengthen your batting lineup and play a legitimate bowler as an off spinner who can who's as good a batter as Glenn Phillips. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's. I think. I think it's not. We're not there yet. I think yeah. you need you know? to see. You need to see him do something similar on a good batting surface that's not that's offering not a lot of turn yeah. and bounce. Like if he if he goes and does that in Melbourne or Adelaide, then you know you've answered. Yeah. That that's question. been the challenge for him so far. Is that basically when things don't go right for him, he starts dragging short, and he's very very easy to hit. So the, the, we'll see. I, look, I guess the reality is, I, I don't think we're going to see too much of that in this modern era. Because th- these guys aren't going to bowl more than four overs for for nine months of the year. It, it is going to be the, the longest spells they're going to bowl are going to be in Test match cricket. Mm. Um, and look, I'm not a spinner, but y- you are, and I, I'd imagine you'd tell us how difficult the craft is and how hard you have to work to be able to build the type of pressure that you need to be able to build. And I, and I think if we look at all the guys that are kind of part time, you know, part time bowlers first. Um, they, they haven't translated as well as someone like a Ravi Jadeja, who's probably, I know he would probably describe himself as a batter, but mm. he's actually had a lot more impact and bowled a lot more overs with the ball for India than impact that he's had with the bat. It's easier to probably bat five, six, and maybe average 38 to 45 yeah. than it is to bat four, five, and average 45 with the bat, and then chip in with 30 with mm. the ball in, mm. in test cricket. So I do think the mentality of those two that you named, though, Phillips and Ravindra, gives them that opportunity. It absolutely does. Because I class. think that both of yeah. them will put in yeah. the yards. I think you can see that with yeah. Phillips in the way that he's developed. And, you know, we've, you know, we know about Ravindra that he just wants to get better and better. So Yeah, and he squeezes into that small shirt real hard, doesn't he? So get the, <laughs> get the guns on show. Yeah. Let's... um. Let's change tack. It seems an age ago, the, the fourth test match in, in Ranchi, 23rd through the 26th of Feb, a win for, uh, a win for India um, by five wickets. Pretty convincing in the end, although, yeah, the kind of ebb and the fl- flow of the game, I, I thought was, you know, a, a, another good one. Yeah, um, great to watch. To watch. We've, we've seen some good um, good cricket. The, the neutrals view, you boys, what, what are your you know, impressions from that, from that fourth test match? And yeah, I guess you've got some notes down here as well. The, the Ollies on here. We'll get the to Ollies. That. We'll get to the, the Ollies. Ollies. Yeah. Oh, look! I mean, as you said, I thought it was a great a great test for me as a neutral watching you know watching the two sides go. I mean, I, I think that we sort of talked in our when we previewed the whole India England series, we talked a lot about there's going to be times where England puts India under a lot of pressure, and and I think we've seen that throughout the series. I know this; it's three one, and I think that kind of goes to show that, you know, in those moments where the game's in the balance, India have won more of those moments than than England have. But we saw that even in this test and at, at lots of different times. And I think you have to give credit to both sides for the show that they're kind of putting on in this series. Absolutely. You talk about India being under pressure with the bat, five for 160 in the first innings, five for 120 in the second innings. So there's a bit to unpack there about England's bowlers. Can they go and finish the finish the innings with, with some clinical some clinical bowling towards the tail, but there's been some tremendous contributions for India in that test in the lower order. How, how did you view it though, Banksy? Because a, a lot of the chat after after the, the game was around, like, was this a big missed opportunity for England? They've been in a situation now, you know, a few times in the series where they've had opportunities to put India under pressure and they haven't quite been able to convert those moments. On the flip side, there's the argument that India is a better side. So, you know, where, where do you actually kind of stand on that? 
Yeah, look, I definitely land on the side of the argument that is India a better side. They're, they've only lost, I can't remember the stat, but three test matches in 177 years at home or something <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, their, their pedigree on home soil is fantastic. Throughout the course of a five test match series, they are going to have at least one innings, if not two or three innings, where they bowl you out with their, you know, with their spinners, particularly in a third or a fourth innings, as they did in this with Ravi Chand and Astri in five for an uh, and cool deep as well coming to the party and mm. and that was really before the pitch started to do anything massively um catastrophic ben stokes, yeah, stokes, will argue stokes would argue with you <laughs> yeah ben stokes would probably be the one guy that can, yeah. can argue with that and then i think when you then look at the way that india approached their chase in that second innings even then you know whilst the ball was probably doing a few more silly things for the large part, it was rel- it was slow, um, and it was relatively you know relatively easy for the guys that got into um, to kind of just not really have that one with their name on a bit of, a bit of luck maybe, but in between it looked relatively relatively easy to bat. And um, the thing that really got my goat was you know I, I think some of the criticism of this England team is getting in the mainstream media that you know and I'm talking really about that you know the Yorkshire contingent um, that, that are talking about the fact that they've got no respect that they're not rude ruthless that they don't reflect and they don't adapt and um, were you not watching the first innings in the way that Joe Root probably played in innings that was exactly the innings that was required Ben Folks um, chipped in with exactly the innings that was required and Ollie Robinson bowling aside and I'm sure we'll talk about that and um, batted in exactly the way that we wanted him to bat in that in that situation and you know got England in you know into the game Baldy then made the point, I think, around, um, you know, were we ruthless with the ball? It was a game where wickets fell in, you know, it's a cliche, but in clusters. And I mm-hmm. think, they did. you know, in- England took some of those wickets in, in clusters and-, and had India six for 170 and seven for 177. And you- then you get a partnership. That's, mm. you know, that's cricket. So mm. they'll probably be disappointed that they weren't able to... Um, probably make inroads with the new ball in that um, in that Indian first innings. And it was really strange for me that um, they didn't take it immediately. They didn't have a crack with Jimmy Anderson. Like, they made a few, I think, tactical errors from, from that um, from that perspective. But then, look, India just, yeah, India just blew us away with uh, with the ball. Um, I don't think you can criticise too many of the of the shots. It wasn't like we were reckless. It was that we, I think, India bowled pretty well. Um, and then, yeah, it looked like India were going to cruise. It looked like they were going to get their non down at one point. Um, so to, to fight back and even have a you know even have a game where there might have been a couple of wobbles in that dressing room, there might have been oh, the odd I'm guy sure was. scrabbling around for his inside <laughs> thigh pad to put on. Then, uh, but but yeah, cre- credit to India, I think is the is the is the three word answer. <laughs> <coughs> from a from a selection point of view, it's actually a, a stark contrast if you look at the series stats. India's you know main bowlers are all well under thirty. Uh, England's bowlers main bowlers are all well over thirty from an average perspective for this this series. Indian team have talked about picking bowlers who can take twenty wickets. Um, you know bowling to strategies that can take twenty wickets in a, in a test match. Have England maybe not focused on that enough? Taking twenty wickets. Can I jump in here? Yeah, uh, they've got some. They've got three really, really young spinners. I, I think there's been criticism of them over the course of this series, and there's been some commentary around like Joe Root has been by far the best spinner in this series for England. I think the reality is that England have just missed having their most experienced spinner in Jack Leach be available for them. He hasn't been available since the Ashes, which were like mm. three or four years ago now, surely. <laughs> um, but I, but I think you know it's when you get into those situations where you've got a side five for 120 that your experienced you know, premier spinner is the guy you turn to to do the job for you. And unfortunately for England, as good as their young brigade of spinners and Hartley and and Bashir and and Ran Ahmed have been so far on this tour collectively, they are inexperienced, both at test level and at first class level. They're young guys and they're learning their way along the on the job. And, and that's fine under McCullum and Stokes. That's totally OK. But you will have to take sometimes the good with the bad a little bit in that they're going to make mistakes along the journey. And they're going to find themselves in situations where if they had that same innings now six, seven years down the track, they will take care of business. But at the moment, they're just not as experienced and they haven't learned all of those life lessons the hard way to be able to go and do the job. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I'd probably agree with a lot of what Bordy said. I also think if we'd have taken those five wickets, I don't think that that stat would be the same. Um, mm. you know, definitely wouldn't be the same. I think we were going in actually comparing, I think, after the third test and saying how well England spinners had gone in comparison to the Indian yeah, spinners. Yeah, England spinners, England at, spinners were, were at 30 yeah. and the, the, the Indian spinners were at 40 and it was Bumrah that had been the difference in those first couple of test matches. If we'd have got over the line, I think we'd be saying, well, actually, England spinners have bowled not, maybe not as well as, and certainly not with the same level of class, but they've, you know, they've done a really, really good job. And look, I think we've just got to look at the fact that, as Bordy alluded to, these are young guys. You know, this is a, you know, literally less than 10 first class games between um, Bashir and Hartley leading into this series. You add Ran Ahmed into that little bit more, a little bit more experience. And then, you know, you've added a bit of Joe Rooting as well, who's looked at times that the guy to, uh, that, that Stokes has, has, has turned to. Let's talk about the Ollies, though, because I think you know that's going to be particularly one of the talking points from from this game. Um, Raj, you, you've got both Pope and Robinson written down on your uh, on your notes. I think. Yeah, well, yeah, Robinson struggled a little bit with the ball. I don't know if you saw that in the fourth test. Um, His speeds were I'm, lower than all of the other spinners. <laughs> I guess my, I actually probably wanted to focus more on, on Ollie Pope because, you know, we talked about him before the series and how, you know, when he was selected, we thought maybe he shouldn't or maybe he didn't deserve that. That number three spot came out, almost put up a 200. Um, however, has has really struggled, I guess, since then uh, with a pair in this test match. Um, where, do you, where do you sit with Ollie Pope? Yeah, look, um, I think I've used this word before. He's looked frenetic at the crease um, mm. every time he's coming to bat. You know, I think quite famously, you know, Kevin Peterson used to literally down a can of Red Bull um, just <laughs> before he ran down the steps and went out to bat to get um, get the heart going up. I, I think Ollie Pope could do with down in a can of Valium um, <laughs> and, and really trying to calm himself down as he gets out there. And look, that might just be an exterior perception. He might tell you that, you know, he's fine and he's, t- you know, he's, he's not ticking. Um, look, I think again he got done by an umpire's call, didn't he? Where he was advanced down the wicket, you probably your first thought was, "Oh, well, you're going to be unlucky to get given out there," and he was. Um, but yeah, look, the, the numbers don't argue. Other than you know, obviously that one big score, he's really struggled throughout the the course of the series to impose himself. Um, ha- yeah, hasn't seemed to have a method really for getting through that first twenty or thirty balls. Um, whereas you look at someone like a Duckett or a Crawley, they've worked out an effort to get past that first 20 or 30 balls and arguably um, then they haven't then been able to go on and put that one um, big score on the board. I, obviously Duckett got one you know, big 100, but I, I don't think um, uh, Crawley's gone past you know, 60 or three, 70 or something like that. Yeah, 350s in the series. So there's, there's got to be a little bit of a concern. I think that that concern is exacerbated by the fact that other than Roots 100 in this game, he hasn't really contributed from uh, from number four. Um, I think if you'd have seen a little bit more from that engine room of um, of Root and, uh, and and arguably Stokes to an extent and as Bairstow well. And as well. At and, five. and Bairstow, who's it's been you know, a bit of that, hasn't yeah. it? The England's top or, or England's openers will get off to a really good start, start and then suddenly they're 100 for four. Yeah. I think that's what we're finding though yeah. in this series is that India have some really, really good spin bowlers. And once <laughs> they come on, it's batting becomes very, very difficult. Not only does it become difficult becomes very difficult to get in against those guys yeah, as well right that, and you know absolutely so yes, no surprises there so look it's definitely a, it's definitely a question mark I think Harry Brook clearly will, will well I'll say clearly I think he'll clearly come back in as soon as he's fit and available again um, but wh- who he comes in for I think is that you know is the big um, the big question. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about Ollie Robinson, but Johnny Bairstow, this will be his 100th test if he plays. Mm. All reports are that he will. Um, there's a pretty good chance that he, it's his 100th and last. Um, wow. Well, yeah, yeah, could p- be. P- p- uh, look, there's a lot of permutations, but yeah, I yeah. think, um, you know, there's an argument that Brooke definitely comes back in um, for, uh, yeah, probably for, for, for Bairstow. Um, and that, I, yeah, that might be the chance. I think if Pope didn't have the 196, I think he'd be having that conversation about Pope. Ollie Pope, I think. Yeah, you know, if you, if you take that, I mean, it's hard to take away a guy's yeah. 196. Yeah. But I mean, take away his double hundred. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Match winning no, performance. Don't. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't take it away from him. But, but yeah, I think something that leads on from that conversation about Bears though is it, I'm quite interested to contrast the way that the two keepers batted in this this test. And I think it. I mean, one just massive credit to Drew Jarrell. I mean, 
both, I mean, even in the previous test, the way that he's come in and just kind of looked the part immediately, I think with, I mean, I've been impressed with him when, with the gloves. I'm not, you know, not a, not a connoisseur of wicket keeping like you are, Binksy, but like he's the, uh, that catch of uh, Jimmy Anderson in that second, uh, that second innings. I the thought was very important catch of Jimmy Anderson. You well, don't want to drop Jimmy. It was very, very impressive. And, but you know, the way he, the way he batted in that innings, you know, from what was it? 177 for seven yeah. to kind of get them through to, you know, a very competitive total in the end and and just yeah the way he you know we talked about Cameron Green the way he kind of batted with the tail the way Drew Jarrell was able to bat with the tail and be make make good decisions you know for someone who's playing and like we talked about the pressure that those young Indian players come face when they come into the side the inexperienced players you know they're playing for there's so much depth mm. they're playing if you you know you miss out you show you don't show your your worth straight away you might not get another shot. So the way that he's come in has been has been super super impressive, and I think in the in, the, in the, on the flip side, I actually think it did Ben Ben Folks a disservice the way that he was tasked with that skill in the second innings for England. I think it was when he didn't really have that skill, and that's not it's not necessarily a knock on Ben Folks, but the way that he goes about his cricket, it made it very difficult when he was batting with the tail and stuck, you know, stuck with them, that he couldn't accelerate and kind of, England got stuck a bit there for a while, didn't they? I think they went like one and over or two, you know, one and a half and over for about 20 overs there. And yes, that's not, you know, yes, it was a very difficult pitch. Like, I'm, it, it just wasn't the way that England have gone about their cricket. And I think that, you know, if you think about what might happen back home for England, I think that might almost be a tick back in the Bearstow camp for taking the gloves back in those conditions where keeping was potentially not as difficult. Yeah, look, we'll have this debate next yeah. summer, I'm sure. Um, I, I still think there's a place to play your best at keeper in England. I think that you know the ball does wobble around a little bit. I think you want to you, you want to hang on to every single edge that you can. And I know those are cliches, but you know that's always going to be my view. I, look, I, I don't I don't think this is necessarily a conversation around Jarrell versus uh, Folks. Jarrell had a fantastic uh, fantastic game with the gloves as well. So did Folks. Mm. Um, I think the difference for Jarrell, particularly in the second innings, was. They went a long period of time and I, the, the commentators kept calling out, you know, it's, it's been four four weeks and, and 16 days since the last boundary. Like, <laughs> th- th- there'd been a long time yeah. in between in, in India being able to force a boundary on what had turned into quite a slow uh, slow pitch for the, for the most part, apart from that odd one that did something a little bit um, weird. And when Jarrell then was able to kind of go after it was, you know, was, was really when they got the target down to something that they thought, you know what, now we won't, can really take that option because that will put the pressure back on England. It, it, you know, it prevents the fact that there's a little bit of a squeaky bum. But also he was batting with number three, mm. whereas folks was batting with guys that wouldn't have survived if he wasn't taking 80% of the deliveries. Um, and then look, India, I just think, you know, bowled really well. Yeah. Um, toss one up to give him one down the ground and then you know bowled really well at him and then toss one up to give him one down the ground and um, yes he doesn't have probably the experience that someone like Jarell has had in the IPL at being able to take those you know those boundary options against mm. uh, against spin um, so you know, I, I think a lot of credit's got to go to the way that he batted, and um, also to be honest, the way that Rohit Sharma and Shubman Gill batted in that in that uh, second innings, particularly as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, really, really, you know, put in a, a pretty decent um, performance to get the chase off to yeah a, a good start too for a hundred, and and then it's a cruise from there. I mean, Baldy, Raj, do you guys want to want someone want to jump in about Gill because you know two tests ago. We were talking about him as someone who might be starting to feel the pressure mm. of an Indian side when you know the, when everyone's fit when KL Rahul comes back. He's answered those questions pretty well. It's been a zero sum game for the number threes, hasn't it? Really, I mean, Pope was good in the first test, and and Gill was under pressure, and then Gill came good. He's made fifties, made hundreds. He's looked very, very good at number three, starting to firm his place up in the side, and and Pope has become under pressure. So you know, it's it's been a zero sum game for the for the number threes in the series. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, but from a pressure perspective, I think unless your name is Virat Kohli or, or Rohit Sharma, you're always under pressure. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's shown with, you know, they've brought in the um, the younger Indians or less experienced international Indians who have just been stress tested at the Ranji Trophy where they've got that pressure on them every week. Uh, you can see that they can just step up and make that that, that change. But uh, Gil's been exceptional. Yeah. Um, um, any other plaudits for India before we maybe move on and look at changes for the the, the, the final test? 
I mean, the spinners were great, weren't they? I mean, we kind of we kind of touched on on that a little bit, but I think uh, I do think that Cool Deep throughout this series has kind of uh, you know firmed firmed his way into being like a top class spin bowler at the moment. The changes mm. that he's made to his game in terms of you know bowling faster, a lot of the things that many people have talked about, and and we've also talked about a little bit in in the last couple of tests, how he kind of plays. How, you how know, do you get him into an attack on the road? Yeah, yeah I, is, is I, a different story. Isn't I it? have no idea because yeah. you know Ashwin and. Uh, uh, you know, and Jadeja are obviously still probably above him in, in the picking order, but you know maybe he's jumped now Akshar Patel in, in the way that he can at least contribute at home. And I mean, you know, they'll have enough tests at home that he can still mm. get a good run at it. But yeah, I've been, I have been very impressed with him, and, and he just seems to be getting better and better. And, and obviously Ashwin, you know, doing his job. Increasing his pace has been a big part of that too, because the the benefit for Akshar is that you know he dumps it in and he's quick and and he, and he get, the one that gets you is the one that doesn't spin mm-hmm. and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Cool Deep is now as lethal in the, in those kinds of areas, maybe not as lethal as Akshar, but he's competitive in that area. He's also now competitive a little bit more with the bat. He scored some valuable runs mm-hmm. in this Test match. So when you're starting to compare those two guys as the third spinner for India, there's less and less between them. And you know, two Test matches ago, Stuart, I asked you whether or not Cool Deep was ahead of Akshar really mm. in the pecking order and it seems like over the last two test matches he's really answered that question for us absolutely what's going to happen in the fifth test Pinksy um, look I hope it's 3-2 uh, I, look I hope it's a good game of cricket and look, all all reports seem to suggest it's going to be a little bit more seamer friendly um, the weather being one component of that and then the ground as well uh, one where I think even into that World Cup that's just taken place there was a, some games in mm. Nam where it you know did offer a little bit more for the seamer, so be interesting to see that the ba- the balance. Um, I'll let you guys probably cover where India might go, but hundredth Test match for Ravi Ashwin, hundredth Test match for Johnny Bairstow. Is it for uh, Ashwin as well? Yeah, yeah. wow. Um, and we got Kane and Saudi in the in yeah. the uh, next Test for New Zealand. Big milestones yeah. coming up. Yeah, so I th- so I think um, England. I think Mark Wood um, probably comes back in. You would suggest. Um, if he's fit and and um, or, you know fit to, to get through five days, um, Jim, Jimmy Anderson's had a bit of a tweak, um, but, but again, I think uh, reports are that he's um, yeah he's fit to play. Uh, uh, yeah, look, it, it's a really difficult one because England have gone with a mentality of giving guys plenty of rope, yeah. uh, giving guys plenty of opportunity. That you know, is this the time to send that message? And and I think that's got to come down to the individual. Brendan McCullum gave um, Ollie Robinson a public, not quite dressing down or humiliation, but you know, made comments around that his performance wasn't up to scratch in that fourth test. And if if memory serves, that's the first time yep. he's done that in his uh, tenure as England coach, where he's actually delivered that kind of message through the media to say, mate, you know, pull your socks up. So it'd be interesting to see whether or not they go with the mentality of you average 21 in test cricket. Um, we've given you a little bit of a rocket and this is a seam as, you know, a seam as venue. We need better from you. Or whether they des- deliver a message, which is, sorry, mate, you can mix Gus mm. Atkinson's Gatorade, um, and and he's the guy that um, he's the guy that comes in. I'd like to see him given an opportunity. To be honest, uh, you know, I think whilst we want to win this Test match, um, you know, we've already you know already lost the series. Um, but I think what England will do is go with who they think is the best option to you know to, to help them take twenty wickets. Um, my feeling is I'd I'd pick Gus uh, Gus Atkinson. Um, and it probably means that we only go in there with one uh, one spinner. Um, and I think Hartley would get that nod for me um, based on the fact he's our leading wicket taker in the uh, in the series uh, so far. Um, offers a little bit more with the bat. Um, and yeah, because I said at the start of the season that his ceiling's <laughs> higher than Jack Leach. So um, I'm going to continue. Yeah, continue. Uh, I'm going to continue. Me, yeah. yeah, continue to back him. But yeah, look, that's what I hope to see. And look, I hope to see uh, Johnny Bairstow do what Johnny Bairstow does. Which is when people are calling for his um, for his head, um, he you know delivers a message to the to the press box with his bat. Totally, Baldy Raj, what do you think? In, what do you think India's going to do? Because I mean, we just talked about cool deep. Like these three spinners have been great. Mm. If it's going to be a seamer, more seamer friendly track, 
What do they do? Can they go in with three three seamers? Oh, I don't know if Siraj is back. If Siraj is back, then he probably comes back in naturally. Akash Deep has been really, really good. Um, I thought he was probably one of the guys we haven't talked about very much, but has been really good for India over the last last wee while. Uh, so he would be he would fit right in there if he was picked ahead of Cool Deep. I don't think India will change too much, but I think if Siraj is fit, he probably comes back into the side uh, and gives them that balance. We we don't expect. Boomer back, do yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Boomer's back in the squad. Boomer's back, back and Siraj mm-hmm. played the last game as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, so Siraj and, so, yeah, Siraj and Boomer, I think, will be there. It's a question of whether Akash Deep has done enough to kind of stay in the side mm. and, yeah, and whether they go with that balance of, you know, they'd probably have to then drop Cool Deep, I think, would be the one to, to drop out, even though, yeah, yeah as we said, he's, he's been excellent so far. Mm. Raj, any advance? Nothing from me. Sorry. You know what I'm really interested in in this fifth test is what the narrative is going to be both from the England camp and from the media win or lose, you know, because England have done a tremendous job controlling the narrative, um, even if you don't necessarily, um, some people don't agree with it, but they've done a tremendous job controlling the narrative about how they play and, you know, results don't matter and all this kind of stuff. If England go down to India 4-1, it will be very intriguing to see what the narrative is from the team. And, and also what the narrative is picked up from, as you say, Binksy, the, the, the Yorkshire contingent, if you like, the, the harsh critics of, of baseball that are calling for a, a, a you know, regression to softer, gentler, um, slower scoring times. As people if, should be if, careful what they wish for, to it, be honest. Exactly. Um, but, yeah, I think that the narrative will be fantastic, uh, fascinating for me, particularly if England win. Um, it will be fascinating to see what that narrative is. Yeah. Uh, and, look, again, as Raj has said and as we've used quite often when Raj hasn't been on the pod lately, things are never as good or as bad as they, mm. uh, as they seem. And I think mm. if England manage to win two, they'll have won two of only five or six games yeah. that have been won in India in the last five or six years by visiting. Visiting, uh, visiting teams or whatever that stat is. Even if they win one, they've won more than they should have done on the basis of the, the you know the recent uh, the recent sort of stats. Um, I think England's narrative, though, brought it to answer your question, will be whatever they win or lose, it'll be that's fine, it's gone. We now move on. Mm. Um, we're not even going to look forward to the next test match. We're going to look forward to the guys going and playing some golf and seeing their <laughs> family and mm. playing the T20 World Cup and all, all these kind of things. And then we'll kind of get on with whatever's uh, whatever's next. So um, I, I don't think the narrative from those guys will, will change. Um, the interesting thing is when it you know comes time to move on from Brendan McCullum, who's going to uh, who's going to tell him? Because I wouldn't want to be uh, mm. I wouldn't wouldn't want to be in the, uh, that guy. I find it strange, you know, leading into this series, how everyone thought oh, baseball's going to go and win in India. Like that that's that's not something that's easier to do. Go and win <laughs> three tests in India to win the series. Um, England's put a decent foot forward, and I'm sure we'll review it in the review. Uh, pod that we do, but uh, they definitely have not embarrassed themselves with baseball. Brilliant. Well, yeah, plenty of milestones um, coming up um, in this test match. Hoping uh, Jimmy Anderson might make his way to 700 test wickets. He's on 698 uh, currently in a massive 186 test matches. It's remarkable, isn't it? It is unbelievable. It is, uh, and especially because he wasn't always picked as well. Oh. Like, um, And yes, we talked about Ravi, An- uh, Ravi Chandra and Ashwin as well. Um, he's got to his 500 and he's playing his... 100th test match Johnny Bairstow as well and plenty more milestones around the world of cricket we are going to be down at Hagley um, so we will be coming to you with plenty of podcast uh, content particularly on the social channel so we'll try and do um, some wrap ups on uh, days of the test match down in Hagley Australia versus New Zealand but for now it is good night and good bless from us all here on the Top Order podcast we'll see you again next time see you later